Welcome to this episode of Root and Unwavering. We're broadcasting live from Phoenix Business Radio X. And this is where we help people and leaders connect more deeply to their innate potential. I'm your host, Hilke Farber, and I'm here today with Dr. Valerie Bimo. Um, I'm so happy you're here today, Valerie. How are you today? Thank you, Hilke. I'm honored to be called to this uh, podcast. I'm doing fantastic. And I'm going good. I'm looking forward for our conversation. Thank Great. you. Great. Wonderful. Well, I'm really happy that you're here. I just checked my files. That's how I know how I long how know I uh, how long I know people. And it seems like we know each other since 2013. So that's 10 years. So it's almost like a celebration today in another way. I'm gonna say a little bit more about Valerie. Uh, and before I do this, I'm also gonna say a little bit more about this podcast series, Ruta and Wavering. So Ruta and Wavering is a series where we every two weeks speak with a leader that we admire for their sense of being rooted and connected to what's truly important to them, what their, their, their deep core priorities. And we do this conversation so that we can help each other and learn from these leaders uh, about how we can do this in our own lives, in our own leadership. How do we stay rooted and connected and, and learn all these from all these different stories about what that's like and how we can show up our best. So Valerie comes to us, and I admire Valerie for many, many reasons. And if you just look at her resume, you know that just causes uh, a pause, like, wow, there's, there's so much here. Uh, so I'm going to share a little bit about Valerie and then also share a little bit about my personal experience with Valerie, um, and then we'll have the conversation about being rooted and unwavering. And as you're listening, I invite you to just to think, keep listening for what am I hearing here? that helps me to be more rooted and unwavering, whatever happens in life. So Valerie is a distinguished leader, motivational speaker, coach and mentor, and an internationally recognized expert in global health and humanitarian response. She was born in Cameroon and educated in Ivory Coast, France and Spain. Uh, she has a strong reputation uh, as a cross-cultural connector and thought leader her ideas are based in multicultural lived experiences. She's multilingual and she brings throughout it all a deep sense of being, presence, spirituality. She has 20 years of experience in international development. She's worked with communities, uh, organizations, governments, local, global, and uh, she works on strengthening systems and empowering leaders to create lasting social change. Now, she's been doing this work for a while now at the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and you work there primarily with the poor and vulnerable communities across the globe, especially those impacted by natural disasters, disease outbreaks, and conflicts. And you know, she's worked in all the places that we hear about on the news, and some of them we don't hear about on the news, like the Haiti earthquake, the uh, Ebola outbreak, the Cyclone Idai in the Mozambique, uh, thinking about helping uh, refugees in Bangladesh and uh, also in Jordan, the Syrian refugees there, and then also recently or the last few years, co-leading the foundation's response to the um, COVID pandemic in Africa. Now, throughout it all, she's committed in, in, you know, for passion for, with passion for solutions, and she's very focused on shifting mindsets and thinking about how you remove institutional and systemic barriers to empower individuals and groups to create locally grown solutions. She's also a coach, a team facilitator. She brings presence and those, those little things or those big things that help you sort of sit back in your seat for a moment and plunge into your heart and bring more of what you truly want to be to the fore. Um, as I said, I know Valerie for about 10 years. I'm struck by her originality. It's very creative, very caring, very strong. There's always a sense of this deep strength, which I sense like an ancient strength that comes through her. And I'm so looking forward to a conversation with her. She has a medical degree from the University of Côte d'Ivoire and an epidemiology diploma from the University of Paris and a Master's of Public Health from the Madrid Autonoma University, and she's also a certified trainer and coach. Uh, amongst many other things, I also know you are a certified yoga 
infrastructure, uh, amongst many things. So, Valerie, so much to lean on. We're talking about the connectedness in this podcast. Can you say a bit more about get us started on what have you been learning about connectedness in your life? Um, thank you, Ilka. Um, who are the person you were talking about in that is it's amazing. Um, for me, connection is is everything. It's the essence of a human being. Um, starting by who we are, we are a web, and all the different classes show us again that connectiveness comes from the simple things that we we look a lot in the in the African in African philosophy. We talk about Ubuntu. That is about Ha, I am because you are, you are because we are. And I think for me, this is a summary of, for me, the connectiveness, it how we connect with ourselves, because without connecting with ourselves and be aligned with ourselves, we cannot connect with others. Mm -hmm. And as we connect with others, we cannot connect with others without really acknowledging the environmental in where we, we are living, connecting to everything around us, to even the time. How do we connect with time? How do we connect with the elements, the different elements, the nature, but with each other? But the more important, you can only do that if you can connect with yourself. You get authentic and you check on yourself first. You cannot only connect and be if you find yourself yourself and if you're authentic. I think for me, that is really the, the whole of connectiveness. I love that. You, you talked about Ubuntu, uh, I am because we are, and then also making the direct connection to uh, connecting to myself and then my true self and then the connection to eternity over time uh, and, and all that's, that we're part of. So, so say a bit more, Valerie, because that sounds so good and, and I think many of us can relate to this. How do you think connect to that and how have you learned to connect to that in your life and leadership because you know you've had a few decades of experience doing this life and so I'm curious about how you've been learning about that it's a journey and I'm still learning and I'm still growing um, every day as we we learn just if you look at them how when you are really tired or you just everybody I don't know about you but for me, going to the beach and start walking on the sand, suddenly you feel your, your shoulder relaxing, everything. It's almost like magic, but actually it's normal. It's the element. Each time you see a beauty, a wonder, you, that owl make you feel like, oh, wow, there's something bigger than I am. And as, as you start listening to that, you get more in tune with yourself. And also... Um, thank you for a lot of guidance from people from you as a, as a coach to start be, to, to start be honest and looking at where I am, what are my fears, what's, what, are, what, who I am. And it's usually have to have the courage to go back in who you are, looking at the artist as like a book curious and then start thinking wow i did all that but a lot of things i could have done different but you acknowledge it and you're grateful for where you are and all the things that all the people things location that you go around and more important i feel like the more i grow work and go around different culture and different space one thing I learned is that all human beings, we are all, one of the things that we secretly all want is to belong, is to be loved. This is actually, even when we don't recognize it, is part of it. And I've seen that however you talk about languages, ethnicity, places that have been around the world. And I visited so many countries 
almost 100 or 60 something of the countries. And still, that is the truth. And that is the one thing that you see across the world. Even when I went to places where people have lost everything, refugees where they lose people, they lost all the valuable, they are moved out, living in the tent, in the basic infrastructure with basic need, even not met. The one thing that unite people is to feel the sense of like they seen, they are recognized, they are loved, and they belong. Mm -hmm. And that is the essence. And we as human beings, we need to feel like we are nature. We are belonging to the earth and we are part of it. Unless we are aligned and in harmony, I don't think we'll be able to be feeling that connection. Mm. I'm very struck by your description of people that have lost, quote unquote, everything, at least everything material. And then at in the midst of that, and you're not talking from book knowledge, you're talking from actually having walked there and walking there. And I know how many times you are in those places and whenever i talk to you you're always coming back from somewhere or you're going somewhere and somewhere is usually across the ocean somewhere in africa or asia um, so when you think about those people that have lost everything what do you learn from them <laughs> you know the first things that it's always taught me is that people look at me and say, wow, you are so good. You're giving so much. But actually what they they don't understand is that actually they are the one who gave me so much. Mm -hmm. I'm maybe help them and facilitate. I don't want to acknowledge that I'm working with a, a great organization who the generous organization and I bring resources. Nevertheless, Actually, but my soul, they feel my soul. And one of the things that, the first thing you realize how grateful you have to be for every day. And life can switch in a, in a dice like that from everything to nothing. Then acknowledging what you have is the first thing. And be happy with basic. And you start really complaining about not having a hot coffee or hot shower or the water is not as good or it's not smelling as well as you want to and you start really appreciating be able to have a shower that's the first thing mm -hmm. but the more important is you go to some of these spaces and one thing that struck me is they are usually more giving than we are you go to somebody's tent they are so happy they will give you the few things they have. Because what, what is important is that sense of love and sharing. Mm -hmm. And I always amazed with the generosity, mm -hmm. with not much. But also one of the things that is, you know, a lot of the time you go and with your eyes of material eyes, you come and you feel like a little bit like sad, pity, and then the next time you you go, you you look at the person, the next minute you realize that they don't need your tears; they need your smile. And you start looking at them as human beings. You start looking at them like not with the cover, but who they are as a human being at the center, with their heart, with their hope, with the belief. And then it's changed everything, mm -hmm. and you realize that you are speaking with the a human being with a heart, and that make a difference. And when they sense that, you start having a conversation. You start connecting, and you start be two human beings, and the material disappeared. Mm -hmm. That is the beauty of. Sometimes you you almost like wow. They don't even have to bother so much about so many things. Mm -hmm. They they are at peace in a way. It's a bad way to say that, but they are they are centered, rooted, and you appreciate now that you are who you are, not because you have everything with what you have as material, 
but what you center on and how your heart is is what make who you are yeah so it's it's getting out of the static of our material existence where a mind make judgments about I need this and I need that and, da, 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 and unless that it's not going to work for me. Mm -hmm. um, and what you're saying is that these people, and of course they're making generalizations, which is not fair, but some of the experiences you've had point to humans being able to live from a different place that we probably all long for in a way, that sense of being loved, belonging and and love that comes from inside of us. Mm. Yeah. I I really like how you're how you're talking about that. And at the same time, these people they're you were working in emergency relief. You know, they're they've just lost everything because of an earthquake or an an outbreak or some or something. So how do you help them then? Because in a way, they already have it. How do you help them? Uh, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a bit contra contradicting what I, I was saying earlier. Uh, like they have everything, but they don't have everything. They, they still need a lot of materials done, but they have their heart. And as long as they are breathing, and that is what we have to recognize, as long as you are breathing, you are present, there's still hope. And, and the different in different group that I saw, people who still have hope can see the future, can believe that there's something coming out of it, will have a better chance to actually attract that something. And, um, and the way we help them is different way. Um, from the basic needs, water, food, um, shelter, making sure that they receive the the healthcare, the kids are going to school or having a space where they can still be kids because sometimes we forget about that. Kids have to be kids. And then that is the basic. But more and more, there's a lot of discussion about, you know, at the beginning when I started this work, a lot of the work, and we th that is where our generous mind thing is like, oh my goodness, they have lost everything. We have to give them something. We have to then be like, oh, they should have clothes, they should have this. And we tend to come with stuff and decide what they need and what they should have, what type of food is good for them, what type of water or clothes or the kids and education. And you have to remind yourself that before the crisis, they were living their life. And as parents, they, they were taking care of their family and they love their kids like every parent in the world and they want the best for their kids. And there's a lot of changing now in the way humanitarian is like, instead of coming and distribute things to them, that is expensive, is different, and you this, you can only distribute a number of stuff. But people are individual. People have different needs, different value, different thing. Then there's more and more discussion about how do you give in, instead of coming and giving stuff, giving them cash, unrestricted, and let them make decision of what makes sense for them. Mm. How they can actually work in the way that because a family may have a, a kid who diabetes or a kid who needs some or an elder, it will not be the same thing they will need as food. Or you may like maize or corn, and I may like cassava. Then how do you give the choice? Because one thing is about dignity. Everybody mm -hmm. want to feel like I'm, I'm, I'm making some choices on what is good for my family, but I give them access to resources without making decisions and let them make decisions on their day-to-day -day life. It's just that changed everything. Mm -hmm. Even a sense of dignity is like, I'm still alive. I can still make decisions, even if the fun comes from somebody else. Then I think there's a lot of evolution now to recognize the need for people to keep their dignity and to stand strong and and high. Right. Yes, it is dignity. Dignity 
is such a powerful word. I, even as you were saying it, I started to sit up more upright in my, in my own chair. And maybe as we're listening to you, that may also be happening for, for all of us that are listening at the moment. I'm struck by you talking about dignity and also your own background growing up in Africa and then moving to the U.S. and now working for a uh, Western-based organization, the Gates Foundation. So can you tell a bit more about, like, what have you been learning about dignity and connecting with dignity? First of all, growing up in Africa and then coming into the Western world. Yeah. How long we have? Um, I can sp I can spend the whole day talking about that, but I'll try to get some simple thing. Growing up in Africa, there's something that my grandmother, my mom, my father always said is that it's not about how much you have. Is you have to be happy with what you have, and you have to cherish what you have, and not looking at what you are not you don't have and focus on what you have i think that is the first things to that growing up is was a reality and i didn't grow up in a poor family i have to recognize i was a middle high income family educated parent but that come from family that were long rural family a mixed um and big families then Coming to that mix of rural, urban, educated, non-education, it reminds you that it's not so much about always education. And I just cherish my grandmother and by the name, her name is Bemo, I, I carry that name. She was not educated, but she was the smartest woman I could see. And she knew how to manage people deal with the big family, be in, in that space without education, then I think a lot of time we made the mistake of kind of putting education as the smart because you have these diplomas, yeah, because yeah. you have this education. And I think that's the first thing you learn. The smartest, more ab agile, more connected people are not necessarily the PhD. I'm sorry for those who's PhD, it was not a, I may have been a doctor, but it's not that who make who you are. That is the first thing you learn in Africa. And that sense of community, sense of, mm. you cannot be uh, uh, happy or be centered if everybody around you is not. Then you share whatever you have, you'll be taking care of each other. You Then you live in a sense of community it's the big things that growing up in Africa, you learn early age. And then you come to the Western where it's become like an individual. Initially, it's shocking. It's like, okay, what did I miss here? Sometimes you think, is it me? And, and you have to learn that because the society has been so focused on the I and the individual, People feel that that is what it is. It's my nuclear family. It's me and my small family. But we saw in crisis like COVID that we recognize that we all need community. Even if the society makes us be an individual one, we all need community. And COVID, the US shows that we stop being a community and then it hit us really hard. Do we know our neighbor? Do we say hello? Do we actually talk to our colleague more? I do, and I learned it from you actually, Ilka, to do a check-in when I'm in meeting, to ask people, how are you doing today? Mm -hmm. Before even going to the topic. And it changed everything. And mm -hmm. that's why you realize no matter how rich educated, we all coming back to again the basis. We mm -hmm. need to belong. We need to be loved. We need to be seen. Mm. No matter where we are and where we're born, it's mm. actually a reality of the human being. And that's why we call human being, not human doing or being reaching. And I think that for me is still the basic. And 
I wish the Western world, the richer world, will come back to this reality that community are essential mm -hmm. and um, and we still need to stay, find a way to connect to each other. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, it's almost like a survival in a way yeah. um, for the human race. Yeah, so I'm struck by the paradox in this. And I, I struck by the paradox of starting with your sharing with community is so important. Like we are part of something. And if my community is not in harmony, there's something for me to give, right? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I remember you in the beginning of our podcast talking about connectedness starts with me. Mm -hmm. So say a bit more and maybe talk about what you learned from your grandmother, Bimo, mm -hmm. about embracing that paradox of being myself and maybe not getting lost in the need to belong and mm -hmm. to be loved. I love the the prayer of Francis, of Saint Francis. Like it's it, it's in giving that we receive, and it is in uh, like pardoning that we're pardoned. It's a sense of like so. So say a bit more about this paradox of being in community mm -hmm. and being yourself, because I can imagine. From the Western perspective, it's like, yeah, no, I don't want that African, quote unquote, community because I like to be me. Mm -hmm. I, at the same time, from a Western perspective, there's probably this, well, at least for me, it's like, oh, that that expanded network of community that seems so rich. Mm -hmm. So say a bit more about that. Indeed, it looks like a paradox, but one don't, doesn't exclude others. And for me, being a community require you to be authentic, require you to remove the mask. Because only when you are you, you can actually give what you have. Because it's about sharing. It's about being you. It's about what you bring to the, to the center. And if you are you, then you bring that real you. If you are not you, you cannot bring that. Then it's actually force you to find your space. And, huh. and I think one thing I remember is that I'm coming from big families. And, and I'm not the first one or the last one. And you know, you have to find a way to, to step up. And the stepping up is not by copying. If you copy the others, then you don't exist. Then you have to step up to find your space and to get your character. And I think it's the same image. If you want to be, because it's about like, what can you contribute? If you're exactly the same like everybody, then you can contribute. But if you bring your real value, then you have something to contribute to the society. And even the Western world, when we said we want to be me, 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 guess what? We are in the world where if you are only you in the world, we need everybody. You can go, we saw it COVID, you go to the supermarket, if people are not coming to work, guess what? If the farmer are not farming, guess what? You will not have the food or become too expensive. If the restaurant cannot recruit the server, that usually we don't consider the cook, then they close. And I think for me, this is really the reality of the, the me, but me part of the bigger. And if the me part of bigger cannot identify in the real without mask authentic, then you are cheating. And you can cheat for some time, you can have a mask, and sometimes we believe that that mask is who we are, but in the long run, it will hit us back. Beautiful. I, I love this whole theme of being embracing the community noticing that I am part of that and I'm nothing without it. Like I need the food and my community also needs something from me, right? That is true. And then at the same time, but what the community needs is my real me. You know, what is my real me? I remember uh, a, a master coach teaching me this question. What can your community not afford to lose? 
what gift of yours can your community not afford to lose? And when I think about what you've just been saying also about the refugees or people in, the, in, in those situations, that it's a lot about helping people to be restored to their dignity and to help to acknowledge their authenticity and their authentic choices. Mm -hmm. And that creates true harmony in, in community. So go ahead, Valerie. Yeah, no, I just wanted to add one thing. When you're talking about the people, you know, the most amazing things I saw in some of this community, you go and distribute food for because some are maybe eligible or no. And then that woman taking maybe a, a, a bag of rice, bringing it back, and then she's probably poor. And then she starts distributing a cup to everybody else. And you're like, but this is you. She said, yeah, what is the point for me to eat in if the other people around doesn't eat? Because actually it will not work. Then she have a small thing, but the generosity with mm -hmm. that small thing of sharing, even that small thing, they say each of us need to eat something, even if it's small, versus me eating a lot and nobody else eating. Mm -hmm. And I seen it with the scarcity they can have. They still manage to share. It's a very humbling uh, realization that the poor are often more generous than the rich. Is it not, is it not a paradox? This is the real paradox. Mm. Talking yeah. about paradox. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. That's, well, we're going to explore this more. We're going to take a break in a moment. We've been listening to Dr. Valerie Bema, which is who works at the Gates Foundation. Uh, a lot in emergency relief. And we're talking about how do we stay our true self and be in community. And we've been talking about the generosity of people who are really connected to their community. Like the example that Valerie just mentioned about this person that had some rice and then just started sharing it with everybody because he said, listen, if I don't, if the people around me are hungry, what point is there in me being full? So let's take a break now. And after the break, we'll explore this more, this paradox of how do I stay myself? And we'll explore a little bit more also about what are the masks that I may be tempted to put on to be part of community. See you after the break. You are listening to Rooted and Unwavering, presented by Growth Leaders Network, the leadership team and culture development company if you would like to learn more about working on connectedness for yourself your team or organization please contact growth leaders network on linkedin and now back to the show welcome back we're doing a rooted and unwavering podcast i felt almost weird about saying doing I feel like we're more being a rooted and unwavering podcast, which is what you've been pointing us to, Valerie. Valerie Bimo is a deputy director at the Gates Foundation, very much focused on emergency relief. And we've really been exploring this mm, paradox, you could say, about being yourself and being in community and the generosity that comes when we're firmly and like found, founded and connected to community because we cannot but be generous. So Valerie, let's focus on the mask bit a bit. So tell me a little bit about and tell us a little bit about the masks that you may have put on in your life, disconnecting from your true self and how you stepped out of those and what you learned stepping out of those. So maybe... Give us a few examples from your life, some masks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a lot of masks. Um, I think the, the, the first thing is that, uh, as I said, I'm coming from, a, uh, we, we are six in my as kids. And uh, for long, I was the quiet one, the fifth one always in the low case. And then I have my siblings, my sisters, more vocal, more present, more thing. And then I was just couldn't speak as much. And then I have to be the pleaser of everybody. I need to be 
sometimes be the small and disappearing because I didn't want to to show myself. And then the second one is to trying to please and make everybody feel happy and pleasing and put that mask of like, I love everybody, everybody love me and all that. And then <sighs> rapidly I realized that um, I was giving, 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 but that giving was not actually an innocent giving, even if you, you are generous, but it was not, it, is, it was giving for something in return. Mm -hmm. It was not like, oh, it was, it was giving. I'm generous and I'm still, but there's always a behind that must create an expectation because I give, because I did, then they will love me more because I, I please them they should be love me more than I'll belong and then I'll be thing. And the more you do it, the less they look at you, the less you belong. And then you get frustration. I remember for long, I was always the one like calling because I've been living with our families a little bit everywhere in the world, calling everybody, expecting them to, to call me back and then complain they don't call me back. Oh, it's always me. I say, I love you. Nobody replied. If I don't call, nobody called me. And that, it was frustrating. And then I started realizing, huh, it's okay. Why do you need them to, if you want to call them, call them. But is it, was it a, an exchange of calling or is it because you just wanted to showcase? And I work on that a lot to when you have a generous mind or you are a giving person, it's a little bit a contradiction from what I say. You are a giving person, then you give, 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 give. You give in mean things that you should not give or you cannot give. And suddenly you realize that you were expecting love out of it. You were expecting them a thank you. You were expecting a, oh, I love you. And it's not coming and you are frustrated and you're, you feel like, oh, they are ungrateful with you. You give all these things. You're always the call. Nobody call you. And the day you have something, nobody is there. And then you have to step back. It's like, what is going on? Why are you doing that? And then after a lot of work, you like realize that, you know what? Actually, I always give with, there was a back fear of expected to belong. But when you start be a bit more you to say, you know, I love them. If I want to call, I call because I want to hear them. I want to be, if I give, it's not, if they say thank you, it's a bonus. If they don't, it's okay because it feels my heart to give. And just getting to that simple change of no expectation, love unconditionally, giving because you want to give, not because you expect some, even the thank you is an expectation. Mm -hmm. And just shifting that, it gets you light and at peace because it's like, and if the thank you comes, like, oh, wow, okay. They call me back, oh, wow. But at least you you feel like you really gave with unconditional love. Mm. Yes. Yes. yes, yes, yes. So I hear you say this, this sense of I'm in the heart. I'm giving. And I've done the work to let go of the expectation. The expectation of what's going to happen next. Mm -hmm. right? And maybe you can say a bit more about what fear that expectation is born from. Like why even have an expectation? Where does that come from? Maybe you have to tell me. I don't know. But um, I think it's, it's that sense of fear of abandonment. Yeah. Because as a human being, like I said, we want to belong. We want to be part of a herd. Yes. And our reptilian want to be feel connected. Yes. And we, we feel like if we don't have that love, we'll be alone. We'll be yes. abandoned. We'll be sad and things and then we start really grappling to like i want to be part of this community i want to 
I don't want them to let me, I, I want them to love me. I want them to see me. And actually you, you act because it's a mask, because it's not exactly mm. the, 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 from the heart. Mm. You actually create the reverse. Yes, that's I. What I how I relate to this is when I'm connecting from the head, it's transactional. It's yes. like I give you this, and therefore I you give me this. So this tribal fantasy, basically, that's the unhealthy part of tribe. Like the unhealthy part of tribe is, I give you this, so you give me that, mm -hmm. which means that I'm always compromising myself because I'm actually not daring to be myself. Yes. Right, that that would be too dangerous to do that because I might be abandoned. To be truly myself, I have to be willing for you to quote unquote abandon me or have a different preference or not call me back. Right, so you saying I'm going to make the call because that comes from the heart, and my inference is as you do that, you experience the joy and the fulfillment that comes from actually following your heart, and that by itself is the reward. Well put. Yeah. In the Bhagavad Gita, they say, you know, it's it's not the fruit of the work, the result of the work that's the fruit. It's the work itself that's the fruit. And when I first read that, I thought that was absolutely nonsense. <laughs> right? Like, I want the bonus, the kudos, the thank you, the you're so wonderful. And what you're pointing to is, no, actually, the truth of doing the work, being the work, that unconditionality that creates the sense of fulfillment because you're connected you're in harmony yeah yeah so say more about how that works for you in the communities that you're part of being connected to yourself unconditionally unconditionally giving and also not with all these expectations what have you noticed in how your relationships may have evolved Um, it's so funny because uh, even in the work environment, we we are in a work where people there's a lot of expectation, and uh, and there's a lot of mask. And in some time they even I said coming in this space of uh, global development, global health, international development, and at the level where I, I feel. Being a woman, black, um, African, is not always coming in your advantage, mm -hmm. and uh, and you have to, initially you try to to belong. You want to put the mask of speaking the same way, the language, and and the more you do that, the less you are actually, and the less you. Because believe me or not, even if I try, I cannot change my color. Even if I try, I cannot change the, who I am. Then instead of trying to be them, it's actually embracing who I am. Mm. I'm a woman, I'm a black, and I'm African, and I'm not even a first language English. But by the time I start really looking at that, it changed. And you know, in the day-to-day -day work, sometimes I, just by being, you don't realize how many people come later, other African, other Black, even the like to say, you know, you inspire me. Like, the way you stand, the way you are, it makes me feel like be more myself. I want to embrace it because I feel like sometimes ashamed or want to belong so much that I change the way I am, the way I dress, the way I... I've been, and actually by doing that, it's okay to, to be you, who you are, and you are still at that level. And I think I see that every day, and I want to be an inspiration. Because one thing that I also recognize is that, especially in Africa, we're coming from a colonial system. We, here in America, we're coming from a slavery system. And in the way, even if we, the slavery is finished, we still have a lot of unherited mask and, and sense of 
inferiority in a way, even if we stand stand up. And we tend to be putting the mask because the way we speak and I, your way you speak, your way you stand, your way you been trying so hard to merge the Western America system that you stop being who you are. Mm. And I learned to really embrace who I am mm. and I'm being proud of who I am. And the more I do that, I start being proud and I realize that I have something to share. I have something to offer because I come with my authentic self, with my cultural differences. And lately, the last two years, a lot of people have been talking about diversity, about the uh, DEI, diversity, equality, inclusion, and all that thing. People focus the diversity on the color. I call it the Benetton color. It's like how many black or how many women? But for me, it's not so much about the how many black or women. It's about, do they have space to express who they are, mm. as they are? Mm. Do you create that environment? And in a lot yeah. of places, it's not. Then they still be a numerical numbers, but the inclusion is still a big, long way in most of the places, even when we're talking about diversity. Sorry, I went a little bit. I answer your question, but I open another topic. I I love it. I I love it, and I'm also noticing as I'm listening to you a sense of compassion for those of us, including myself, who sometimes give in to being in transactional community with others. You know, it's it's so much of what humanity in its current state of evolution has been promoting. I give you this and then you give me that. It's so deeply ingrained. And what you're speaking to is moving from transactional community, which is not real community. It's, it's community like a lower maturation phase, right? It's early maturation. Um, and more mature community is authentic community where we can be ourselves. And I love what you said about being able to be and create space where people can truly be themselves, not some diversity and inclusion metric. Like I got so many black women or Asian, whatever, you know, LGBTQ, whatever. No, that also has a place, mm -hmm. has a place, but that is not the, what we're talking about, what you're talking about here. Yeah. So, Valerie, say more about your being a leader, right? And when I read your resume that you sent to me, I saw the word spirituality in there. And to be honest, I was a little shocked because here I see a leader who is so much in the world, you know, who works with big but governments, local organizations, lots of funding and things like that. In the middle of that resume, I saw the word spirituality. So can you say more about talking about being authentic and being yourself? How do you connect to that? And how do you bring that deeper self sense to everything that you do? Because I see you doing that. Yeah. Thank you for for that question. Um, I believe in God, and I believe in something bigger than all of us. Um, it's not about religion. It's not about which part of the religion. Yes, I'm Christian. I'm born Christian, and I'm still following it. But I made an, a lot of effort to learn about other religion, to mm -hmm. learn have a lot of practice the Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, all that pieces. And one thing came to the same. It's like the first thing is love. The first thing is like recognize it is something beyond you and bigger than you. And the more I embrace also nature, learn a little bit more, you know, I've been 
more and more connected to that love, the one that, one thing that come clear is that I can't go, you go to some of this amazing nature and then you just see that it's like, it has to be something bigger. It has to be a God that's a creation. And you see the connectiveness with even trees, how everything, a forest, everything work together, seamless. Even if it seems like a stick is inert and is there, and you realize that it is. And when I talk about spirituality, is you have to go with the space of love, of being, of compassion, but also empathy to know that everybody, again, human being, want to belong, the love. And when you get to that space, you start seeing everybody else around you with the same desire to connect to something in the God. And opening that space help you really be that authentic and seeing I can be, like you said, in the refugee camp with somebody who have lost everything and see that woman sitting there smiling with her because of her heart, of who she is, not what she lost. And the same thing, I'll sit with Bill Gates with all the million he has, and he's the same human being with the heart beating, smile or no smile. And when you start being in that space, it's so beautiful because, and for me, you can only be that if you are addressed, if you embrace the spirituality of human being on the heart of everybody by nature have the similar. Um, as long as you breathe, and your heart is beating, you are. And if you are, I am. And it's just as simple of that. And we breathe the same air. We, we have to share our resources. We are interconnected. And the world become even a small, small space with the connectivity. And again, COVID shows us how small it is, even if it's a big world. We are so interconnected. was becoming quiet as I'm listening, Valerie, I'm just becoming quiet. Um, I'm struck by this phrase, you know, it's the person in the refugee camp who's breathing and smiling or not smiling, who is, who is that, who's part of that bigger whole and Bill Gates as well and everybody else as well. And that's all the same. And we're all breathing. We can know that. And so when, when we are connected to something bigger than our, what I would say, ego mind, separate sense of self, we start to see everything like the harmony of the trees, uh, where everything is connected with each other and we cannot but have care for it and be generous. And it's all sort of start to be this, this dance, you could say. And that's what I'm hearing and what you're saying. So, the question I love to ask towards the end of our conversations, and amazingly, we're already close to the end, Valerie. What would you say to somebody who is not feeling connected today to themselves, to people around them? Maybe, maybe not only today, but maybe for a while, maybe for months, for years, who does not sense that and maybe because they're listening, otherwise they probably wouldn't be listening, have some kind of yearning for that. What would you say? It's a journey. We are all in that journey and uh, every day, it's an everyday reality. And you have to look at it as a, not the destination, but the path or the roads or the the way because you have to be committed on the day to day to find that when i wake up i do a prayer and i connect with myself and to god and then i ask that i've been who i am 
and I have challenge during the day. And it's up to me to like, hmm, what's, why is it happening? And to do a check-in. We'll be having some high and low. We'll having some days where we feel like, oh, who was that person? This, who is this speaking? And you have to look at it and love yourself. Have a little bit of compassion with yourself and not beat yourself, but love yourself and say, hmm, maybe I can do better tomorrow and a bit different but that simple journey of going inside yourself and checking with yourself i'm talking about checking check it with yourself checking where you are and trust god and just looking at god sometime to help you and with god will come other people around in your journey you have some coach you have some some people and it's not always the person you think it should be it's not always your, your boss, your director, the richest person or something. It can come with the unexpected space. Like I said, when I go to the refugees, actually they give me sometimes more than what I give to them. They resent me. They root me to the sense of life. Then look around you. There's always a message for you in the supermarket. Do you say hi to the person who is in front of you, who serves you? Give their name. Next time you do that, you see. You see a Margaret serving. She may be this. Just say, hi, Margaret. How are you doing today? As she said, and you see the difference. The smile, you may have made her day. And the same thing. It may come from anywhere and just be open to, to embrace it and to be, it may be difficult sometimes, but I guarantee you at the end, the more you sent and the more you're happy, the sense of peace, of light that you have in the day to day, it cannot replace anything else that material will bring to me. Thank you. Last question. So you work in emergency relief. So my sense is day, uh, every day on your screen or when you're actually with people, you see lots of things that could be construed as hard. How do you relate to that from the space you just described, if you do? One thing that you, you see there's a lot of destruction. There's a lot of emergency every day, for sure. Is to first feeling like I have a space where I can do something. I can help. I can be in. That is the first thing. The second thing is that is to able to see beyond the number, to see a face, a people, and to contribute the best way you are. And that for me make a difference. When I'm, I have resources, of course, coming from the foundation and even personal, is that question, how can I be of a service with the resources? It look a lot, but it's nothing compared to the needs. Then how do I best use this stewardship of these resources that is entrusted me? to do? What is the best approach? How can I support? And how can I support the people? Because there's a lot of intermediary. What is the best part to get to that people without having all the, from the tube going away? Because at the end, in a lot of our system, it's almost nothing getting there. Then how do I be stewardship of the resources that have been entrusted and that I have the privilege of managing now? And that, and when you get to that space, you're like, oh, I can do something. I can be in there. I can space and tell you the truth. What I like about traveling, after a few months of just sitting in your computer, it become numbers. And then you go to the field and you see one person and you hear their story and it makes so much sense. You're like, okay, it's not just 100,000 person or 50 people is that face. You can put a face, a heart, 
a person beating in that and that satisfaction is just changing make you forget about the sadness and making you feel so grateful that you can actually be in part of the space to to do something well, thank you valerie thank you valerie and we're getting to the end of our conversation i want to say yeah big big, big thanks to you um what I'm taking away also from this last bit of our conversation is to live from this generous heart and open to what's around us, not get lost in the mind of the numbers, the I can't do anything, extending, and then the rewards like meeting Margaret in the supermarket or the conversations with the people that you're meeting in the places where there's been real hardship and uh, just meeting them and really listening to them. I sense the presence you bring to them and then the transformative power, the miracle that happens in that. So we've been listening to Valerie Bimo today, Dr. Valerie Bimo. She, very, she works at the uh, Gates Foundation in emergency relief. Uh, a big takeaway I had today was about how important community is and how from Valerie's story, it's always, whether it's in the supermarket or whether it's with somebody you serve or whether it's in our family or whatever it is. And that's important to stay authentic, to be connected to our light and to also realize that we are not what we think we are. We actually connected to something much bigger. And that is a journey for each of us to explore every day. So Valerie, anything else you want to say by way of closing? Thank you, Ilka, for the opportunity, but to everybody to remember, we all have something to offer and we have to be open to receive as well when it comes our way. Thank you. Thank you. We always have something to offer and also be open to receive it as well. That's a beautiful place to end our conversation today. Uh, you've been listening to Root and Unwavering. We're going to have, and we continue to have um community conversations on LinkedIn through Growth Leaders Network. You can check those out if you'd like to learn more. Also, um, you can subscribe to this podcast, for example, on Spotify and other places. And we will be here again with um, Gaurav Bhatnagar, who is the author of a book called Unfear. I love that title. Uh, on February 10th, he's also the founder of Co-Creation Partners. And he will speak with us again on February 9th. So that's it for today. You've been listening to Rooted and Unwavering, where we help leaders connect more deeply to their innate potential. I'm your host, Ilko Faber. See you next time. Thank you for joining us in today's episode of Rooted and Unwavering, leadership conversations about courageous connectedness. Presented by the leadership development company, Growth Leaders Network. To learn more, subscribe to this podcast. Connect with Growth Leaders Network and Hilke Faber on LinkedIn. Or read Hilke's award-winning book, Taming Your Crocodiles. Now take a moment and appreciate something that is great about you. Celebrate the gift that you are and enjoy connecting more deeply to your best self today. See you next time on Rooted and Unwavering.